our first speaker of the evening. I've got a I've got a student, and then Larry's got a student. So um, I'll introduce mine, and then uh, after that presentation, then uh, Larry will introduce his. But we have uh, our first student colloquium of the of, of the semester. So welcome. It's an exciting time to hear about what some of the science that people here at ASDRP are working on. So our first speaker is Harrison Shu. He's a senior a year, a little over a year ago, uh, where he began working on uh, the chemical synthesis of unnatural analogs of natural products. And he's been working on that ever since um, to try to optimize their structure for biological functionality. Um, so let's see, Harrison, are you here? Yes, I am. Very cool. All right, can everyone see my screen? Just to clarify. Yes. Cool, cool. All right, well, I'll just go ahead and get started. So, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Harrison Shu. I am a senior at Dory Valley High School, and I am part of the new research group. And so today I will be talking about the mechanistic insights into the design and synthesis of natural product analogs and modular mimics for anti-cancer and neurodegenerative therapeutics. Let's put my major pointer real quick. So first off, just to give an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to first talk about natural product chemistry. What is it? Why is it important? All that good stuff. And then I'll dive into the two specific projects that I have. I want to talk about today, which is the andrographite analogs, the development of different analogs of andrographite, as well as the synthesis of rivastigmine and carbamate analogs. So first things first, what is a natural product chemistry? So it is the study of natural products, which are substances produced by living organisms. And so the reason why natural product chemistry is so important is because oftentimes they have many therapeutic advantages. So we can see here, um, looking at this pie chart, that natural products as well as natural product derivatives and natural product mimics have a significant proportion of therapeutics in the market right now. We can see here that natural product derivatives uh, encompass about 18.9%, as well as natural mimics or natural product mimics encompass like 11.5 and 11%. And so we can see here that they, they are essential in the therapeutic market. And so they're very important for therapeutics and development of medicinal uh, methods. So when dealing with synthesis and when dealing with like how to work with natural products, we have two main goals here, which is either to take these molecules that nature creates and be able to create them at a more scalable fashion or a more effective fashion that's less expensive or less inefficient to extract. Or the second goal is to create different versions of these natural products, whether it be derivatives, analogs, or natural product mimics. And create them to become more bioactive or more effective in pharma pharmaceutical uh, means. So we can see here that there's an example, here's vincristine, which um, has pharmacological uh, benefits, but the thing is that the extraction from plant actually yields about a 0.003% yield. So that's a really, really bad yield. And what we wanna do is we wanna take this compound or other scientists would wanna do this and make it in a more scalable fashion, or just create an analog of it that would be more easy to create. So just look at some examples of natural product chemistry. We can see that there's a uh, chrysomycin A, which when creating an analog resulted in improved potency. Another example of this is arlomycin AC16, where when creating an analog, it resulted in a different mechanism of action when actually treating uh, certain bacteria. And so it resulted in the ability of it being able to treat uh, drug-resistant bacteria. Another example here is that there are uh, improved physical properties of BLMA2 by um, replacing this hydroxy group right here with a methyl group, and it resulted in more rapid DNA cleavage. So essentially saying that all this natural product chemistry is just altering a natural product can result in improved physical properties or improved pharma pharmacological properties that are um, desired. 
So now on to our projects. So reactivity informed design synthesis and target delivery of andrographite analogs and F kappa B modulators for cancer treatment and degenerative diseases. So this entire project is about andrographolide. Andrographolide is a lab named terpenoid that is extracted from this plant called Andrographis paniculata. And andrographolide is a really effective compound because it's kind of like a hit all. It can it has been shown to actually treat anti-cancer. It's in uh, clinical trials for HIV AIDS as well as other degenerative diseases. And so andrographolide is a really powerful natural product and specifically inhibits NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B is a transcription factor that is involved in many cancer pathways as well as uh, cell survival pathways. And so basically meaning that andrographolide has some capabilities in treating cancer and are in clinical trials for such. When looking at andrographolide, we looked at this in two different methods or two different sections, which is a C-ring butenolide, which is largely focused on reactivity and biological activity. And we also looked at the AB-ring transdeclin system, which is mainly focused on enabling binding and altering bioavailability, or at least that's what we hypothesize. So when taking andrographolide, there are three, or just any natural product in general, there are three different ways we can look, around, look at this. We can either totally chemically synthesize it by taking available or industrially available um, starting materials and totally synthesizing the analog and then, or it, totally synthesizing the natural product and then creating analogs from there. Or we can go through the biosynthetic engineering pathway where we uh, biologically engineer certain species or certain, um, certain like bacteria to create the analogs and create the compound. Or, which is what we took, is to take the natural product and actually edit it with certain reactions, certain methods through semi-synthesis. And therefore, we actually create these analogs. And so that's what we did. We took andrographolide and we created different analogs. Specifically here is the top piece analogs, basically meaning it edits the C-ring butenolide, that top half of the andrographolide. So first off, we create acetonide, which is we treating uh, andrographolide with 2,2-dimethoxypropane, PPTS, acetone, room temperature, 45 minutes, and we get a good yield for acetonide. And acetonide is very important, and I'll talk about this later, but we have an entire study about this um, focusing on the hydrolysis of it but that's currently irrelevant. Let's first talk about these analogs. So acetonide, we can add on an acetate group to this C14 hydroxy group right here, and basically just as an acetate. And then treating it with a base, we also result in this 1415 elimination product here. So this is the 1415 elimination product. To acetonide, we can also add DBU, which is a strong base, as well as phenyltriflate to actually result in this 1112 elimination product. And so these five compounds, the andrographolide, acetonide, acetate, 1415 elimination, and 1112 elimination, we took a look at these and wanted to study their microaddition properties. And so our hypothesis is that andrographolide, as well as these analogs, would react with a cysteine on NF-kappa B. And so cysteine has a thiol group, thiol group meaning a sulfur. And so the sulfur would react as andrographolide, resulting in this adduct, where the andrographolide binds the cysteine, and as a result, it inhibits the uh, NF-kappa B. And so it does this through a microaddition. And so andrographolide, acetonide, and all these other analogs are supposedly good microaddition acceptors. And we wanted to test this out through a colorimetric assay, or specifically a disulfide competitive colorimetric assay. And so what this basically was is that we took a synthetic mimic of cysteine, and remember, cysteine has a thiol group. We took a mimic of this called glutathione, which has a thiol group right here, and reacted it with our analogs, whether it be andrographolide or acetonide or whether, whatever analog. And so depending on how good the micro, uh, the microaddition acceptor is, the more glutathione reacts. If andrographolide were a really bad microaddition acceptor, then glutathione would rarely react with the andrographolide. If it's a good ex a macroaddition acceptor, then a glutathione will react with the andrographolide a lot. And so we would incubate our analogs with glutathione and then quench the solution with DTNB. And so this any leftover glutathione that isn't reacted with the andrographolide would result in um, the cleaving of the DTNB resulting in 5,002 nitrobenzoic acid. And what this basically means is that it leads to an optical readout of yellow. 
So the more yellow a solution is, the worse our analog is at actually inhibiting, or excuse me, um, to actually uh, being a micro acceptor. So we can we can see here on this table that this assay produced the results that the 1112 elimination product, which is number five here, actually resulted in the, the biggest amount of micro addition because of the fact that there was the least yellow output. And so this hypothesis was supported by uh, a logic that the Michael addition acceptor was not statically uh, encumbered in the sense that andrographolide, the andrographolide as well as every other analog would have the Michael addition acceptor right here at this C12 uh, spot. However, this isn't that great of a Michael addition acceptor because we hypothesize that this olefin here, this alkene, statically encumbers this C12, resulting in the attack, a nucleophilic attack actually not being very effective. However, in an 11 12 elimination product, the micro addition acceptor here is right at C14, which is not really encumbered by anything. And so we hypothesize that that's why it's a good micro addition acceptor. And that's what uh, that it supports the results that are shown in this assay. However, when we actually, per, we actually uh, compared andrographlide and all these analogs to cells and actually seeing how well they treat uh, cancerous cells, we saw that the acetate group here performed the best because it caused the most amount of cells to actually die. And so, uh, yeah, the main hypothesis here is just that a micro addition accepting capability does not necessarily constitute to the best analog just because the analog actually has to enter the binding pocket and actually react with the NF kappa B or whatever protein to actually function. Now, besides our study of the top use analogs, we also have studies in stereochemistry. And stereochemistry meaning basically the alignment of how molecules are structured. So we can see here that um, on the left, we can see that there are, there's paclitaxel, which is a taxol, which is a cancer treatment um, or a, a cancer therapeutic drug. And there's an epimer here, as well as tetracycline, which is a acne treatment drug. And there's also an epimer here. And so what that basically means is that we're just altering stereochemistry of these compounds. And it results in drastically different therapeutic effects. And actually, I believe that these two epimers don't have nearly as much of an effect compared to the natural products themselves. And so we can see here that just changing the stereochemistry once can result in a significant difference in the, effect, the effectiveness of compounds. So we want to see if this applied to antigraphite as well. Now, looking at andrographolide, we have a lot of stereochemistry here, but we specifically want to focus out where this red dot is, this spot here. And so this hydroxy right now is a dashed line. And what that means is that it's going, if you're looking at this, then this hydroxy is technically like pointing backwards or going away from the screen. Whereas if it were a wedge like this, this bond right here, then it would be pointing towards you or like out, out of the screen. And so we want to switch this dash line into a wedge and see if this is actually effective in affecting the medicinal properties. And so we want, we ask ourselves the question, how does one chemically invert a single stereocenter? And so the way we follow through with this is through this reaction pathway where we react andrographlide with TBS chloride or, uh, and basically protect this hydroxy um, with a tert-butyl dimethylsilyl group. And then we would oxidize this hydroxy with IBX or 2 iodoxy benzoic acid, and then we react it with TBAF to deprotect this hydroxy. And, and in the last step, we took this beta hydroxy ketone and reacted it with sodium triacetoxy boral hydride to result in our desired product. And so the way this last step worked, because all the other steps are pretty trivial, they're pretty simple to understand, but this last step actually involves a named reaction, the Evans-Saxena reduction. And so what this reaction essentially does is it takes a beta hydroxy ketone, which is this, and reacts it with uh, sodium triacetoxyborohydride, hydride, and it results in an anti-dialcohol, meaning that this alcohol that is formed is the opposite stereochemistry of the other alcohol. So if this alcohol is a wedge, then the produced alcohol will be a dash. If this were a dash, the dash line, then this would result in the wedge. And this, it, we apply the same thing to our andrographlide because of the fact that we have a dash line here on this alcohol and it will react with this ketone to produce a wedge 
of an alcohol, and that would flip their stereochemistry. And so we are still currently synthesizing this analog, and we want to test the biological activity of this. And just, I guess, to go into more of the nitty gritty, it's the evidence accent reduction is a directed reduction where the triacetoxyborohydride hydride reacts with the, the alcohol, which is on the lower side because it's a it's a wedge, uh, excuse me, it's a dashed line. And so it'll react with the ketone from the bottom side, which pushes the alcohol upward, resulting in a wedge. Now to go into, um, now going into acetonide and how this actually is important, we looked at the hydrolysis of acetonide, but to first talk about like literature, acetonide has been reported to actually be more effective in inhibiting cancer compared to andrographlide. And there could be a variety of reasons behind this, but one possibility is that it has a C log P, meaning that it is basically just more nonpolar. And more nonpolar compounds tend to be able to uh, travel, across, uh, travel across cell membranes much more easily. And so when looking at acetonide, we actually discovered that, or we actually saw that acetonide would naturally hydrolyze under acidic conditions or just neutral conditions. And so this brought up the question, is acetonide a, a prodrug or is it an analog? And so the differentiation here is that an analog means that acetonide by itself um, with this extra acetonide group down here, the acetonide is just naturally better. It just can uh, inhibit NF-kappa B by itself better and it's able to get into the cell more easily, et cetera. However, a prodrug, on the other hand, is basically says that acetonide itself is not that much better compared to andrographolide, but it is able to get into the cell more easily, and then it breaks apart back into andrographolide, and then andrographolide can do its thing. And so this basically means that it, we're basically asking, is, um, is acetonide better because of just its structure or because it can get andrographolide into areas more easily? So we decided to do quantitative studies on acetonide um, through quantitative hydrolysis studies under acidic conditions. And we found using a high-performance liquid chromatography or HPLC, we found that acetonide did actually hydrolyze into andrographolide over time. And so this supports the hypothesis that acetonide is a prodrug. And, we, uh, and this is just an interesting study to see how um, acetonide can hydrolyze into andrographolide. But with these studies came a different question, which is, can we control hydrolysis rate? Can we control how fast this acetonide or whatever prodrug, um, how can we control the speed of how it hydrolyzes into andrographolide? And this is why we took into account Hammett linear free energy relationships. And what this basically does is that it take it looks at the aryl substitutions on um, a benzene ring and and looks at how it can affect the pKa and thus affect the reactivity of certain um, situations. So for example, if we had an electron donating group, like a methoxy group, then it's more electron donating. It results in a higher amount of anionic charge, which reduces stability and so results in a higher pKa. In contrast, if you have a more electron withdrawing group, like for example, a nitro group, then it'll result in a, more, a higher stability of anionic charge and result in a lower pKa. And so we want to see if this can actually affect reactivity by synthesizing benzaldehyde prodrugs of andrographolide. So what we did is that we react dioxane with amber list, which is a base, as well as um, reflux it at five hours and uh, reacted it with some benzaldehyde, whether it be uh, with like two different uh, substituents. And we wanted to see, uh, and we're planning on creating a hydrolysis study to actually plot out how fast um, these prodrugs hydrolyze depending on the different substituents and which position they're at. So we can you can see here that we synthesize a, a methoxy, a four methoxy, as well as a three methoxy, a four nitro, a three nitro, as well as a four chloro and three chloro. And we plan on using these benzaldehyde prodrugs to actually create hydrolysis studies and create a Hammett plot so that we can see if we can control the rate by changing the substituents on these prodrugs. So that's all we have about, or like that's all I want to talk about for andrographolide. Next, to move on to a se separate study, which is less on cancer, more on neurodegenerative disease, is this study of rivastigmine. The modular mimics of neuroactive alkaloids, design synthesis, and cholinesterase inhibitory activity of novel rivastigmine analogs, therapeutic leads for neurodegenerative disease. 
So when looking at neurodegenerative disease and tying it back to natural products, it's much more difficult to actually treat neurodegenerative diseases because there's a thing called the blood-brain barrier. And this is a very selective barrier and it results in large molecules not really being able to cross it very easily where small molecules have a selective advantage because they're smaller and able to cross it more easily. So there are various studies or various treatments that actually are effective for neurodegenerative diseases. We have dopam dopaminergic treatments, which are good for, uh, I believe, Parkinson's treatments, as well as um, movement disorders. We have antipsychotic drugs for behavioral disorders, as well as analgesic drugs for, uh, for like reduction of pain. And we also have cholinesterase inhibitors, which is what we're going to be focused on, what we focused on in this study. So first, to give a bit of context, Alzheimer's tends to be associated, Alzheimer's disease tends to be associated with the loss of function cholinergic neurons. And cholinergic neurons are neurons that use cholines um, as neurotransmitters. And so one important choline is acetylcholine, and it's a neurotransmitter that is used in muscle function as well as autonomic uh, body functions. And so acetylcholinesterase is also a separate enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So if there's a high amount of acetylcholinesterase, it'll break down a lot of acetylcholine and result in the loss of function in cholinergic neurons. And that means that as Alzheimer's symptoms tends to exacerbate. And so our work is focusing on rivastigmine, which is a natural product mimic of physostigmine. And so we wanted to create novel analog of rivastigmine and see if they all in comparison, physostigmine, rivastigmine, and our analogs can inhibit acetylcholinesterase better or worse. So just to talk a bit about function, or uh, yeah, I guess function or mechanism of action, acetylcholinesterase degrades acetylcholine because of, uh, by hydrolyzing it and breaking it apart. And so just go through each of the steps. Acetylcholine has a cationic site right here. This, blue, this highlighted blue, it's cationic, and it is attracted to the anionic site on acetylcholinesterase, as you can see here. Then the serine 200, which is the active site nucleophile of the acetylcholinesterase, would then react with uh, the ester here to actually break it apart and hydrolyze it. And physostigmine is similar in acetylcholine in the sense that it has a cationic site here, this highlighted in blue, which attracts the anionic site. And it also has an ester-like structure where the serine reacts with it. But this isn't any ester, this is a, a carbamate group. And the differentiation is that the carbamate group, there's a nitrogen there, whereas on the acetylcholine, there's only an ester. And so when hydrolysis occurs, where the physostigmine reacts with the active site resulting in the hydrolysis here, this actually inhibits the acetylcholinesterase because this is a carbamate group stuck on the serine 200. And this is an issue because of the fact that this nitrogen donates electron density to this carbon right here. And so it's very difficult for this carbamate group to just pop right off the serine 200. Whereas if we go back to the acetylcholine, um, this ester here is easy to pop off. And so it'll result in a cycle where the serine 200 gets reformed and then it keeps uh, hydrolyzing acetylcholine. But with physostigmine, that's not the case. It doesn't pop right off and therefore it makes it, it inhibits the acetylcholinesterase. The issue with physostigmine though, despite the fact that it inhibits acetylcholinesterase very well, is that it's very poor in bioavailability, it's very toxic, and it's also very difficult to isolate and synthesize. And so overall, there are many issues that come with physostigmine and doesn't make it a very effective therapeutic for Alzheimer's. So we decided to take on an approach of rivastigmine, which has, which is a very similar in physostigmine. Um, and it also has higher tolerability. It's more bioavailable. It's easy to synthesize. It's dermally available. And so it's overall just a better uh, compound to work with for th uh, therapeutic studies compared to physostigmine. And we can see here that rivastigmine also has a very similar mechanism of action compared to physostigmine. As you can see here, uh, the, the rivastigmine has um, an anionic site, which is the nitrogen there, which is highlighted in blue, and it can react with the serine 200 to form a carbamate group right there, which once again inhibits acetylcholinesterase. And we also performed computational studies to see how rivastigmine actually binds to the acetylcholinesterase binding, uh, binding pocket. And so we can see here um, that there are a, a variety of different amino acids that are important in the interactions. As you can see, serine 200 is one of them. And you can see that the purple part, the carbamate group, is actually interacting with the serine 200. 
And on top of all of this, rivastigmine is also a non-selective acetylcholinesterase butylcholinesterase inhibitor, meaning that it can inhibit acetylcholinesterase, as I already discussed, but it can also inhibit butylcholinesterase, which is very similar in function in the sense that it hydrolyzes butylcholine. And butylcholine, as you can see, is quite similar in structure to acetylcholine. And this is actually important to one of our studies that I'll talk about later. So current methods for synthesizing rivastigmine are pretty interesting because it uses this starting material, this 3,1-ethyl, uh, excuse me, dimethyl ethyl phenol, and reacts it with this N-methyl uh, N -methyl carbonyl chloride to create our rivastigmine. But the issue is they use sodium hydride. And sodium hydride, if you don't know, is pyrophoric, meaning it can catch on fire. And because we don't want to blow up, we wanted to, and we also want to develop a better compound. We tried to go with different milder conditions. So you can see here that these are these are some entries of different conditions that we've tested, and we found that using entry six, which is using the solvent dichloromethane, uh, DMAP, and pyridine as the base catalyst, we found that the, uh, we also we got the best results out of this these conditions. Now, on top of our synthesis of different analogs, we had to use characterization. We had to actually determine if we created the correct analogs. So we use nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR characterization. And as you can see here, the way it works is you just assign different hydrogens on the compound and we're able to see if these peaks show up. And so you can see that they correspond to different peaks on the NMR. And if we're able to identify these different peaks, we're actually able to determine if we created the right analog. And so we use this characterization and we use these more milder conditions to create different analogs. So you can see here that it's generally the similar conditions, except we just use a different carbonyl chloride. Instead of using an N-ethyl, N-methyl carbonyl chloride, we use um, just R groups, so just different types of uh, different alkyl substituents. And you can see here that we synthesized multiple different analogs. We can see we synthesized rivastigmine here as 2A, but we also synthesized a, the dimethyl, which means there's two methyls here instead of an N-ethyl, N-methyl. We also synthesized diethyl, so two ethyls. We haven't synthesized desethyl, but we are current work, currently working on um, methods to actually synthesize it. Desethyl meaning removing the ethyl. So you just remove this ethyl, we just get this methyl here. And we've also synthesized the morpholine. Um, which is 2E here. And so these are all different analogs, and we wanted to see how well they actually inhibit acetylcholinesterase. So we wanted to perform a disulfide competitive colometric assay. And so this is actually remarkably similar to the assay that I discussed earlier for andrographolide, where acetylcholinesterase would hydrolyze acetylcholine to choline and this acetic acid. So we used a synthetic mimic of acetylcholine called uh, acetylthiocholine. And so this essentially just replaces the oxygen here with a sulfur. And so acetylcholinesterase doesn't really have any selectivity between acetylcholine and acetylthiocholine. So when we acting with acetylthiocholine, the acetylcholinesterase will hydrolyze, hydrolyze it into acetic acid, as well as this, um, this choline with a thiol here, a thiol group meaning sulfur. And so this means that the less the acetylcholinesterase is inhibited, the more the acetylthiocholine is hydrolyzed, therefore meaning more thiol groups appear. And more thiol groups means more reaction with DTNB, which is 5,5-dithiobis-2-nitrobenzoic uh, acid, and it results in this yellow output. So once again, very similar to the acid I discussed earlier. And so we tested all of our different analogs. We, uh, we have physostigmine as a control. We have morphine, diethyl, rivastigmine, and dimethyl. And we found that dimethyl actually performed the best. And as a result, we thought, uh, we, we hypothesized that dimethyl probably performed the best because of the least steric uh, encumbrance. And so what I mean by this is if we look at dimethyl, there's only two methyls here compared to N ethyl, N methyl, or compared to two ethyls, this is just intuitively smaller compared to the other analogs. And so we hypothesized that the smaller the analog, or the less inhibition there is because of the fact that it's smaller, the more effectively it performs. Now onto future directions, we wanted to look at um, different enantiomers of rivastigmine as well. So the thing to realize is an enantiomer is basically just um, a mirror image of of uh, two analogs. And so they have different stereochemistries, as I discussed earlier. And literature has reported that the S enantiomer of rivastigmine actually performs better than 
uh, the racemic mixture of it. Racemic meaning a mixture of, of the two enantiomers. And so we want to actually synthesize different enantiomers of rivastigmine and actually see if we can see uh, be, to see the biological activity and see which one's more potent and also just study the more uh, the mechanism of action of it. So we can see here that there are different analogs. Um, there's the S-dimethyl as well as the R-dimethyl. And so those are just two different anal uh, two different enantiomers of our analogs as well as the diethyls and the morph uh, morphlines. And we also are looking into the methylpiperazines. And another direction is, as I mentioned earlier, the acetylcholine versus butylcholine. We want to see if, uh, like, how our analogs can actually inhibit butylcholinesterase and see if there's any selectivity. If one of our analogs can only inhibit acetylcholinesterase but not butylcholinesterase, or the other way around. And so, the that's pretty much everything I have. So just to look at some acknowledgments, of course, thank you so much to all of my group members. So we. We have the neuroscience group as well as the andrograph flight group. And also thank you so much to uh, Edward or yeah, Edward New for being my advisor and, and mentoring me. And also thank you so much for all the group members and lab techs. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. And are there any questions? No, but thanks Harrison. You are as clear as an unmuddied lake. Thank you so much, I guess. <laughs> well, it's, I guess, not too surprising there aren't any questions. That was pretty dense. That was an informational overload. But good job. Very good job. Thanks so much. Yeah. Still nothing. I don't see anything in chat. So, Dr. McMahon, would you like to take over? Hello. Um, I would like to introduce Akash Ojia. Um, he is going to talk about uh, particle physics collisions and getting information out of those that tell us about how the collisions occur and what the reaction products are and stuff like that. Akash, you want to step in? Yep. We can see it. Okay, okay, that's great. Uh, can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so let me just start. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Akarsh from the uh, ASDRP McMahon uh, Particle Physics and ML Group uh, for, for fall 2022. Uh, and I'll be introducing uh, our project, identifying and isolating uh, collimated jets from heavy ion collision open data through a hybrid uh, quantum classical approach. So before we actually go into what we actually did for the last few months, uh, Yasha, another presenter from our group, will actually give a short summary of our previous work uh, as he's more sort of comprehensive with it. So yeah, yeah, I should go ahead. Hi, uh, hello. So uh, <clears throat> uh, can you move on to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll start by first explaining what jets are. So jets are essentially the byproduct of particle collisions. And a jet is a narrow cone of hydrons that is produced in a heavy ion collision. A hydron is a subatomic particle that is composed of two or more quarks that are bound by the strong force. And when they collide, they form a quark gluon plasma, which is what is theorized to have existed after the Big Bang. And these heavy ion collisions can produce uh, pions, uh, kaons, uh, protons, neutrons, and or even uh, like nuclei. Next slide. All right, so why are jets important? Uh, jets can tell us a lot about the collision. For example, uh, jets are the basis of quantum chromodynamics. 
which is uh, the theory that states how quarks and gluons come together uh, based on their color. And uh, jet reconstruction is important as jet reconstruction is meant to uh, recombine the different uh, particles of jets. So the kinematics of the original collision can be uh, determined. Our next slide. So uh, what we're doing, the researchers at uh, CERN have mainly worked with machine learning and other data visualization tools to identify the, uh, the classes or flavors of jets using their properties, uh, which include uh, the color, various different uh, color changes and flavors. The flavor refers to the uh, uh, species of elementary particles. And currently we are aiming to utilize a similar, but also a very uh, different approach to classify and isolate jets from the heavy ion data. One method is quantum annealing, an optimization process that uses quantum fluctuation to find the local minimum. A quantum fluctuation is basically a temporary change in the amount of energy uh, in a point of space. Uh, next slide. So uh, to start, we'll be uh, obtaining the 2010 and 2011 heavy ion collision sets from the Large Hydron Collider. These data sets contain various information about the thrust axis color change and information about uh, jet creation, which we need in order to identify jets. So uh, to briefly explain, uh, the thrust axis is a measurable statistic that uh, essentially tells you, uh, sorry, uh, essentially tells you the direction the jet cones travel. And the color charge of a quark and gluons is related to the particle's uh, strong interaction with the uh, quark uh, color hypothesis, which basically states that all quarks have some property that we call color. But this uh, color has nothing to do with like visual color. It's more of a naming convention that is best understood with like uh, an analogy to white light. Uh, so when primary colors, red, green, and blue, are mixed together in equal proportions, you get white or colorless light. And all hydron uh, particles have a uh, colorless, uh, have a colorless property. When quarks come together to create a hydron particle, their uh, color properties will either be in equal proportion or cancel each other out so that the final uh, hydron particle is colorless. And the analysis of the colors of quarks helps us identify the frequency and distribution of uh, quarks in a collision. And we'll be using the 2010 uh, heavy ion set as our training data and uh, train our neural network and our 2011 heavy ion data set to uh, evaluate our model. So yeah, our goal is to attempt uh, to use a hybrid quantum classical approach to, on uh, heavy ion collision data to identify and isolate jets from a uh, heavy ion collision set. Okay, so this is where I come in to sort of demonstrate what our previous approach is and what our new approach is. So let me just start off with our previous approach that we sort of like explored in the previous colloquia that we had. So previously we had discussed our sort of modified classification model where we had a classical computation model where it would behave more like a very sort of standard uh, classification model uh, in involving neural networks. And what we would do is in order to sort of minimize loss and, and uh, sort of change the optimization function, we would change it to a function involving quantum annealing, which we hoped would actually try to sort of increase the efficiency as well as processing speed of uh, classifying jets. But we also decided in the, fast, in the past few months to actually create a new hybrid quantum classical approach. So you might be asking, you know, wh why change the model in the first place? So as you can see here, here's an example of what quantum annealing actually is. This is what D-wave quantum annealing, uh, 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 like the model that we, we explored in our last coll colloquia. And our previous uh, quantum annealing optimization method, like hybrid uh, quantum classical approach, unfortunately was not meant to be used as optimization in a sort of standard classification model or in the way that we were using it. Uh, so let me explain. So 
essentially in our sort of method, we want to take a lot of data uh, describing uh, particle interactions as well as particles that sort of eject out of uh, heavy ion collisions. And we have to sort of take uh, all of this data into context and try to isolate ones that actually have properties that are similar to jet. So uh, as Yasha mentioned, like thrust axis, color charge, which are actually described uh, in you know, numerical data in these AOD files. But the actual problem is with quantum annealing, uh, it's more sort of used for sort of D-wave approaches and it's not really used for what we want to do. So all in all, it would be a lot of work and it was not really worth it to change the optimization function of a predef predefined classification model that worked pretty well in the first place. So what we opted to use this time was something called HQNNs or hybrid uh, quantum neural networks. And as you can see here, here's a diagram of actually a, a hybrid quantum neural network or a, or a sort of normalized hybrid quantum classical approach that was uh, sort of proposed recently in a paper and it's also modified by us. So instead of quantum annealing optimization and like classical classification, we opted to use uh, HQNNs. Uh, and in HQNNs, what we're essentially doing is we're dividing classification into two sets. So one of it is the quantum processor and one of them is the classical processor. And to actually explain what these do and why it's so different from quantum annealing, I'll first explain each. So the quantum processor makes linear transformations and records uh, uh, records expected values and probability of qubits. So if you know a little bit about, about uh, sort of quantum computing in general, you know that qubits are not really something that has a constant value. They're something that are defined by expected values and probabilities. So we sort of use, you know, qubits as well as these record values for expected values and uh, probabilities between zero and one between zero and one, which are sort of, uh, which are concepts of, of quantum mechanics. And we would use this to process uh, our input sort of uh, matrices. And so the classical processor in contrast to that will actually use the processed inputs by the quantum processor um, and then just use it as a sort of standard uh, neural network classification thing that uh, many of us are familiar with. So there will be, uh, uh, hidden dimension layers and, and more to actually predict classes depending on the patterns that, that it would find. So to actually go into depth towards what you know, certain parts of the quantum processor do, so in this case, the quantum processor includes the encoding circuit, the PQC, uh, and then obviously the output that it has. Uh, I'll sort of go in depth and kind of explain what this really means. So how will we actually implement the proposed uh, HQNN method? So the HQNN method here in the previous slide, so a lot of the beginning sort of parts here with the, the laser right here, uh, the encoding circuit includes something called uh, pooling. So pooling is actually pretty common in, uh, if you've ever done anything with convolutional neural networks, you will use this a lot. So the proposed, the pro Proposed uh, HQNN method has one aspect that we want to use, which is pooling in the encoding circuit. So as shown above, it's always used. It's all. It's almost always used to manipulate tensors for HQCNN, which is something that we're not actually planning to do. And we're not dealing with images. We're actually dealing with almost plain numerical data in an AOD file format, which is actually in in uh, sort of you can export in an in an Excel file. So a lot of it is not really looking at images uh, or, or really 3D uh, represent, uh, representations. What we're strictly looking at is numerical data uh, using like the outside calorimeter uh, of the, uh, of the uh, like the CERN LH LHC uh, machine that they have. So what's actually different about our approach which with uh, in, com in comparison to our like, quantum annealing approaches, our implementation involves this very important PQC layer right here. So 
the PKC layer or the parameterized quantum circuit is pretty much the rest of the quantum uh, uh, quantum classical processor. And these PQC processes take the input layer matrices or 2D tensors if you're fancy and, sub and subsequently increases their dimensions to facilitate the classification process. So as you can see right here, it actually takes the sort of features from the, uh, from the encoding circuit that you know, without the pulling method and actually uses it to progressively increase the dimensions so that it actually sort of uses it to carry out the, class uh, the classification process as we want it. And the rest of the quantum processor follows the previous slides. So after this, it would sort of give out the uh, input tensors in the measurements. And then we would feed this into a classical processor as usual, which is demonstrated right over here. So what about the code? So due to the complexity of the proposed HQNN method that we had to learn and also new members have to learn now, uh, the code is still in its early stages and will be highlighted in a later or our final uh, colloquium. So we're currently just working on this on Colab right now. Uh, and I'm actually currently working on it locally. Uh, we, we sort of hope to bring it on the ASDRP uh, like, like cluster, server cluster as well, to actually sort of use that resources as well as, you know, pretty good processing power. So here's a sort of preview of our data that we actually took out, which we didn't show last time, I believe in June. So this is the data that we actually took out. This is just one snapshot of an event run of, uh, of the LHC open data series from 2010 to 2011. So this is basically depicting two heavy ions that actually you know, went, went through the, through the uh, sort of LHC tubing and actually crashed into each other. And what you can see is a lot of different variables here. So these sort of green ones depict a lot of the particles that come out uh, from the collision and sort of these yellow straight lines as well. However, our, the most important aspect that we're actually looking at and is actually recorded in this case is the sort of like conical shape right here. If you can see these like 3D objects extending out from the place of collision, these are jets. So this is what we're talking about. And this is sort of used to actually determine how, how the uh, collision actually went through and you know, other aspects of the collision that we can only get through jet reconstruction. So these cones is actually what we're trying to extract from these like straight lines, as well as these other uh, sort of variables that we're looking at here, if you're, if you're strictly visually speaking. So now you might be asking, it's already segregated out for us. We don't really need to look at this, but the point is actually to train a, uh, sort of a uh, hybrid quantum classical neural network to look at unfiltered data. So none of these would actually be signified. You would just see a lot of sort of particles and uh, uh, quantum particles like spewing out from the place of collision. So we need to take that and actually figure out whether that sort of uh, implies that the jet is in place or not. So this is just strictly looking at it visually. Uh, here is something that took a bit of coding to actually do this is from WebGL and it loaded in the, I believe the event 12 out of 25 from the multi-jet run in 2010. Uh, yeah, in, in October of 2010 from, uh, from the Large Hadron Collider. So you can see here, this image is identical to this one. It's pretty much the same uh, sort of collision that actually happened. And in this case, we are tracking the, uh, the barrel and end cap hits, as well as the multiple jets that actually come out, which I, which you can select it from here. And the actually important part of our data that we're looking at is right here. So as we discussed, uh, there is a chlorometer sort of like at, at the ends of the LHC or at the, or at the like, the perimeter of the uh, large hadron collider like machine that we're actually looking at. So a lot of it's, statistics when the collision actually happens is recorded, obviously. So we have the energy, the five values, the positions uh, of the jets. In this case, we're looking at the jets, as well as we're looking at 
uh, hadronic, uh, uh, hadronic electromagnetic values. And then, of course, uh, polarimetric values to, uh, showing like the hadronic depth in this case. So as you can see here, uh, these are depicting sort of two different jets that I actually chose to show because I couldn't really get a uh, like a, a very nice way to represent all like all like six of these jets that are shown here. So I actually just chose two and sort of opted to show it on the screen right here. And what I actually wanted to do uh, for this uh, presentation was to actually show an animation of how the heavy ions actually collided, which is possible uh, through this software right here. And we couldn't do that due to time constraints. So, you know, next time we actually present, we would love to show you an, an animation of this actually happening so that it is actually easier to visualize. So yeah, that's it from us so far. Uh, thank you for watching our colloquium. Uh, so a few acknowledges before we leave. Uh, we thank our advisor, Dr. Larry McMahon for obviously advising us and being a great mentor. Uh, and we also thank our ML plus particle physics group researchers, one that have been, have been with us for easily like six months plus, and our new members that have actually joined here over the past few weeks. And then obviously, uh, thank you to ASDRP, CSNN for actually facilitating this project. And, yeah, and, and other thanks to those who have actually sort of created this pool for us to look at, which is a quantum fact classification papers. So if you ever wanted to look at how we came up with the HQNN uh, method, this paper right here would probably be the best way. And yeah, that's it from us so far. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. And like I said, there were some great slides there. Didn't mean to trip you up though. Uh, did um, you understand that one any better, Rob? Yes. Yes, I did. In fact, I have a question. And that is that um, as you go from the flattening function back through the PQC, how do you avoid or account for information loss? I think so far, we're actually looking at that problem because it is a big issue. Um, so in a, in a sort of like classical way, there there obviously there have obviously been like methods to actually sort of prevent like information loss from happening, but with hybrid quantum classification, it's a it, it, like quantum cla uh, classical classification. It's a bit hard, um, though it might be still similar. We're 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 still sort of researching that aspect. Uh, right now, we just have a proposed method as well as papers to back it up. Okay, very good. I would like to ask a favor. Yeah. And that is that you allow me to have a copy of this. Copy of what, sorry? Copy of the presentation? Yeah, of course, of course. And we on the cluster look forward to having your work migrate to reside thereon. Yeah, we look forward to that as well. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you. No other questions? What's in, even in chat, nobody can come up with a question. Very good, really very good. Um, you talk about doing a longer one. I want to offer up the possibility of instead of trying to shoehorn it into the uh, proscribed amount of time on uh, colloquia, let's think about doing an entire uh, Saturday seminar and just dedicating a set Saturday seminar slot to your longer version of this. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Brown. All right.
Well, that's it. Uh, great job, both presentations. Uh, I apologize for not asking for a copy of the presentation from the chemistry group, but I'm afraid if I looked at it again, my head would explode. So best that uh, I get all my information from Edward. I find that to be helpful. And if that's it, if there are no further questions, thank you, everybody. Uh, good to see everybody. The attendance sheet, I, I don't have a clue. I'm assuming that that information will come out in the follow-on email. Everybody had a, have a good evening. And uh, we'll talk to all of you at some point or another in the following week. And thank you, Robert, for hosting this. And thank um, David and Edwards for setting up the colloquia. Absolutely. Night, everyone. <laughs>